Kansas City, Missouri City Council for Thursday, August 18, 2016 business session. It's now in session. We do have a quorum. Uh, the first item of business is the approval of the minutes from the business session of August 11, 2016. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any additions, deletions, corrections, or changes? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the minutes of August 11, say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. All right. Uh, next item of business is a streetcar expansion. It's got my name on it, although I'm not sure why, but I'll go ahead and act like I did this. Um, we're going to talk about the streetcar expansion. Who's doing that? You, Doug? Come on up and get started, and let's get at it. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Doug Stone with the Lewis Rice Law Firm. I'm here today uh, as counsel for a, a group of um, residential, uh, residents and voters of Jackson County, Missouri, who have availed themselves of the right under the Missouri Transportation Development District Act to file a petition with the Jackson County Circuit Court seeking the uh, court's approval of uh, <coughs> an election to form a new transportation development district that would provide the funding uh, on the uh, local match side for an expansion of our downtown uh, starter line streetcar that currently ends at Union Station. This expansion would run from Union Station to UMKC, would terminate at 51st and Brookside, generally running along Main Street subject to final engineering. Uh, the reason why I'm here today uh, is um, obviously because the streetcar is a city amenity. Uh, we want to be um, partners with the city on moving this forward. Really, I, when I describe this to people, I, I say that uh, this is a multi-step process. Those of you who are poor golfers like me, uh, I describe it as saying, I'm here to put the tee in the ground. Somebody else will put the ball on the tee, and someone else yet will swing the club. So uh, this process, to be clear, is simply putting the tee in the ground to allow the rest of the steps to take place. Uh, I want to walk you through a, a PowerPoint. Uh, when I'm done with that, uh, Tom Garand, who is the executive director of the Kansas City Streetcar Authority, uh, a separate entity from the group of citizens that I'm working with, will have some, some comments to you about the role of the Streetcar Authority, both currently and in connection with the expansion. Uh, and then uh, we'll both be glad to stand for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Just a little refresher course. Uh, this is the existing downtown starter line that runs generally from uh, River Market in between the Broadway Bridge, the Heart of America Bridge, comes out into our uh, loop, and then narrows as it comes down south. Here's uh, Union Station and Crown Center. <coughs> I think people remember that in 2014, there was a proposal for an expansion that involved three expansion lines, mm -hmm. both this Main Street line south, and then two lines that would go east, uh, one along Independence Avenue and one along um, Linwood, and then there was also funding provided for uh, Prospect Max, uh, Max line. Just in terms of context, this is the downtown starter line. This was the proposed larger district. Uh, that election was not successful. However, when one examines the results of that election, what uh, is uh, obvious is that just like in every prior light rail election that the city has conducted, the Midtown Main Street corridor has voted in support. They did that again in 2014. And so what that presumably tells one is that there is a both a desire and a willingness to absorb the funding within the Midtown Main Street corridor. And so with that in mind, what's being proposed is a narrower district. And I'm sorry, this is a bit of a fuzzy picture, but just generally speaking, <coughs> obviously River, this is the starter line district. Mm -hmm. I'll explain the yellow in, in a minute. The boundaries of this proposed uh, district run along state line 
Uh, they come across 46, go down Holly, come through um, um, Ward Parkway, uh, come down into South Plaza through here. This is UMKC oh. right here, okay? Come across the bottom, uh, come up Troost, hit 47th, hit Campbell, and then follow Campbell north, take in Columbus Park, and hit the point of beginning at the river again. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about funding, and I may come back to this map, but just to be clear, the area that I've described from State Line to Campbell and from the river to essentially South Plaza UMKC, that is the district. Within the district uh, is a smaller area that is uh, currently modeled as an area in which special assessments would be imposed if the election were successful. That is a smaller area than the district as a whole, and I'll, I'll come back to that later. Let's talk a little bit about structure between downtown and what's being proposed now. Very much the same. Uh, the main difference is who is the proponent of the district. Uh, in, in the downtown streetcar, the city and the Port Authority partnered as a joint proponents of that district as permitted under subsection 2 of 238-207. This time, uh, the proponents are 50-plus registered voters of Jackson County as permitted under subsection 1 of 238-207. The system owner would be the city as it is with the downtown line. The taxing authority, the local tax funding uh, would, would come from, now it comes from the downtown district, obviously in the new <coughs> universe it would come from the larger Main Street district and the downtown district would go away. In both cases, it's uh, currently the uh, Kansas City Streetcar Authority, uh, Mr. Guerin's uh, organization, is the operator of the system. Uh, it, it operates uh, in, in uh, partnership with the city and he'll explain that a little bit more. And again, this as an extension of the existing line, the streetcar authority would be the operator. This would be just one continuous line. There wouldn't be any differential in a practical sense. Uh, just a quick note, in case you're interested, uh, the special assessments of the TDD are billed by Jackson County. They come on people's property tax bills. Uh, would presumably be the same way with the, with the new district. Uh, the state of Missouri collects the TDD sales tax, just like every other sales tax, and then remits that money as it's as is directed. Uh, so again, same thing would be true here. Same revenue components as our downtown. A 1% sales tax within that entire boundary that I described. And then special assessments within what is essentially a walking shed. The literature, <laughs> literature shows that within a certain distance of a fixed rail line, there is an actual benefit to property values by virtue of the permanence of the rail, uh, and therefore that's reflected in special assessments that uh, are imposed on the property within that walking shed. It's roughly a third of a mile is the distance, roughly a third of a mile on either side of the line. Uh, the proposed rates are the same rates that are proposed for, that are being in place downtown. Uh, 70 cents per hundred dollars of assessed value and I know you all know but I know we're also on television and so just to be clear the way this works is the county says your property has a market value of X and then depending upon whether you are residential or commercial there is a percentage of that market value that then gets determined to be your assessed value it's 19 percent for residential property 32 percent for commercial property that is the assessed value. That's the value against which these rates would apply. 70 cents per hundred dollars of assessed value for residential, 48 cents per hundred dollars of assessed value for uh, commercial, <coughs> non-residential. Uh, city property, in a way, this is kind of a misnomer because you know the TDD can't actually impose special assessments on the city property. And so I call them city special assessments, but just like we're doing downtown, there's an agreement in place subject to annual appropriation, uh, but it's measured by the value of city property. 
Uh, and then because these are special assessments, not regular property tax, nonprofit properties are not exempt from special assessments. If, if a church or a school fails to maintain the sidewalk in front of its property and the city comes along and fixes it for them, it imposes a special assessment and sends a bill to that not-for-profit entity. That's a special assessment. The same thing is true here. <coughs> this is the case downtown as well. Now, recognizing that, that there are smaller not-for-profits uh, that, that uh, uh, perhaps need a little more protection, uh, what we've done, we did it downtown, the same thing applies here. There is a floor of $300,000, so if a not-for-profit has a property whose market value is $300,000, there's no assessment. If the market value of the property is $400,000, then it's only $100,000 of value that's assessed. In addition, this applied more downtown because of our built environment. But just like in the downtown district, there would be a, uh, an additional assessment on pay surface parking spaces. These are not garages and these are not employee parking lots. These are commercial ventures where you go and put your $5 in the pay box. Uh, they are um, benefited by the line, yet because there's no vertical improvement, in a sense, they're not carrying their fair share as, as vertically improved properties would. And so this is a supplemental assessment that tries to even the playing field. And I'll, I'll explain that again in a minute. So here's what all that means. Again, same as downtown. If you have a commercial property with a tax market value of a million dollars, in 2015, your property tax bill would have been $30,000. The special assessment's $1,500. If you have a uh, residential real property, a condo, with a market value of $200,000, your property tax bill was roughly $3,000, your special assessment's $266. City property, again, kind of a misnomer, but, but for every million dollars of value of city property, it's a $3,300 special assessment. Tax-exempt properties, we talked about the floor a moment ago. Tax-exempt properties with a tax market value of half a million dollars would have a special assessment of $250, $256. Tax-exempt property with a market value of a million dollars would have an $896 special assessment. Back to the uh, surface pay parking lots. If you have 50 pay parking spaces on one of these pay box commercial ventures, your supplemental assessment would be roughly $2,700. Where really what that means is if you have 50 pay parking spaces, you're paying about the same amount as if you had a commercial improved property worth about a million eight. That's the equivalency there, okay? Cost of the project. Uh, you know, a lot of this comes from the 2014 effort, although we've updated the numbers, uh, but, uh, uh, this was all studied when the uh, prior effort was undertaken. In 2019 dollars, it's approximately $227 million project. Um, there are currently uh, four streetcars uh, in the downtown district. Part of this capital budget includes the acquisition of eight more vehicles to maintain, if not improve, the uh, level of service within that uh, extended line. The money to pay for this comes really from three sources. One uh, would be a bond issue that would, would be repaid back from this district's revenue. And when you look at, of course, in some senses it's guesswork because you, you make the best educated guess you can, but we would issue these bonds until 2019. We don't know what the interest rate is going to be in 2019, but you make certain assumptions based on, on, on expectations. We did the same thing in 2011 for the starter line, uh, so no difference. So we've modeled a bond issue, and we believe that will generate uh, roughly $130 million of project fund availability. That does include a coverage factor, so uh, just for those of you that are geeks, 
you know, if you have $100 coming in, the bank won't lend you $100. They'll lend you 75 so you've got some cushion. This reflects a cushion. Uh, in addition, federal funding uh, would be necessary for this project. Small starts would be the program. In the starter line, it was a smaller cost. We used the Tiger Grants, uh, which was the uh, $20 million Tiger Grant, the largest grant issued by the federal government that year for Tiger. Uh, and the only one for streetcar. And the only one for streetcar. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. The uh, uh, small starts is actually not as competitive as Tiger. And our experience with the f uh, federal uh, government is that once they've invested in a project and it is as successful as this has been, uh, we believe we have a very good chance of getting that federal grant. $100 million is the maximum under small starts. For the starter line, uh, there was uh, $17.1 million of regionally allocated uh, federal grants, surface transportation program, and whatever it is that CMAX stands for. <laughs> so uh, uh, we've uh, assumed that there'll also be an equivalent, uh, or actually less, this time around, uh, but uh, we believe that there'll be some regional allocation. So if you add all that up, that gives you $244 million. Uh, we need $227 million. And so under our model, we still have excess capacity. In other words, we could goof a little bit on some of this. We could get a little bit less surface transportation program money. If interest rates go up and we only get $122 million bond issue, it still works. Uh, and so that's the message from this side, this, this slide. Annual cost to the city. <coughs> so um, I want to make sure everybody's, that I, that I explain this adequately. Um, <coughs> under the existing three-party agreement between the current TDD, the city, and the streetcar authority, uh, the city provides uh, a subsidy toward the cost of the downtown streetcar. The subsidy is a million two. Uh, in addition to the million two, the city pays this, we call it special assessments, based on the value of city property applying this, the rate that we showed you earlier. That changes from year to year. As, as city property value goes up, the total at the bottom here would increase. What we've modeled for the expansion is not that. The, the city uh, passed a resolution where it uh, provides $2.039 million from public mass transit fund uh, to uh, fund the starter line. Our proposal fixes the city's contribution at that number. Rather than what's currently the case, which is a floating number from year to year, a million two plus the assessment, under our proposal for the expansion, the city's contribution would be fixed at $2.039 million a year. So therefore, as the special assessments might change, the subsidy would go up or down just because it's the delta between the special assessment amount and the $2.039 million. Okay? Just to show you again, we've done our homework, a uh, little bit of comparison between the starter line and uh, the proposal. Uh, currently, uh, there's around $10.5 million being generated uh, in the downtown starter line, uh, and the uses are about $9.2 million between operations and, and, uh, and capital maintenance costs and the debt service on the existing bonds. Under the proposal, uh, the sources are around $28 million a year in, in 2021 projection. Uh, they are based on uh, current numbers grown very modestly for inflation. 1% a year for sales tax and 2% every other year for property values. Uh, within this larger district, uh, you generate around $19 million from the one cent sales tax. 
about $7 million from the property assessments. There's that $2.039 million we talked about earlier. Uses, uh, operations, obviously with a larger system come larger cost of operations. Uh, working with the streetcar authority, uh, we've put together a, pro a projected cost of operations for that first full year in 2021, $9.7 million of operations. Debt service, $15.7 million. Again, you can see $28 million of projected revenue, $25 million of projected uses. Two points I want to make here, please. One is, for the starter line financing, the city issued annual appropriation debt, really essentially a bond of the city, not uh, secured by anything other than the city's promise from year to year to appropriate funds to pay that debt service. Of course, we're using the revenue from the starter line district, but in terms of the bond owners, mm -hmm. if that starter line revenue is insufficient, the city morally has promised to, to pay that difference. When we modeled, uh, one, one more thing on that. Uh, when we modeled the starter line financing, we had, working with the city's financial advisors, expectations of what the revenue would be. Uh, I can tell you that in, in 2015, the sales tax revenue within the starter line district was 20% greater than what was projected. Property values were consistent. Of course, at that point, the star line hadn't really started functioning yet. And so the value, the property values we would expect to see over the next couple of years from the existence of the line aren't in the county values yet. But the sales taxes are there, and they're 20% higher than projected. Uh, the other point I want to make, and I, we made this uh, point strongly, you know, I'm a development lawyer. And so I come to you occasionally and I say, I have a green field and we're going to put a shopping center here. And here's what I think is going to happen when we build it. <clears throat> we try to be right, but sometimes it takes longer to build it. Sometimes you don't exactly get what you think you're going to get. That's not the case here. When we modeled our financing, both in the starter line and our model for the expansion, we did it based on the existing built environment. Nobody said, hey, there's a surface parking lot that's going to become a 20-story office building. It'll be worth X. Let's add that in. We didn't do any of that. We took what exists today, and we modeled based on that. Uh, it was important that we could look to the downtown ratepayers and say we have a conservative finance model. And it's important to the proponents of the expansion that they can look to that same larger universe of property owners and say it's reasonable to think that this is the worst case scenario and that it will be better than this. Schedule. So. Uh, this is not set in stone. It's, it's a, uh, no pun intended, it's a, um, you know, Catherine chuckled. It's a, um, um, it's a fluid process based off each step in the, in the process. The TDD Act creates successive actions that occur. So depending upon when your first action occurs, the rest could follow after that. But this is what is currently the, the model. We filed a proceeding in June. All of the respondents have answered. Unlike the effort in 2014, there was no uh, opposition filed by neighborhood groups or citizenry. Uh, we had quite a significant trial in 2014. Uh, did not have that this time. September 15th, uh, coming up uh, next month, 
The court will conduct a public hearing. This is permitted under the TDD statute. Courts don't usually hold public hearings. It's kind of unusual. You guys are used to that. They're not. But it will be an opportunity for members of the public to come to the court and express their opinion, positive or negative, to, to the court. It doesn't really have much legal effect, honestly, but it is an opportunity to express your opinion. The next day, the court will conduct a judicial hearing. Uh, because there have been no oppositions filed, it will not have the same uh, character as the last hearing had. But nonetheless, it will be a, a process. Uh, once that happens, there are three successive elections. The first would be an election where the registered voters within the boundary of the district would be asked a question. The question is, should we form the district? Now, unfortunately, the TDD statute doesn't actually let you ask them that. It says, should we form the district as follows? And then there are five pages of legal description you know, within these boundaries and utilizing this financing plan and to build this project. And so, as was the case in 2014, some of you will remember, it was a five-page ballot. We're going to have the same thing here. But in essence, that's the question. Should the district be formed? Because the proponents of this <laughs> district are not the city and the Port Authority, but instead 50-plus registered voters of Jackson County, the TDD board, the TDD is an entity, it'll have a board of directors like the starter line, the board is actually elected within the district by people that live within the district. Uh, so we'll have that election. And then the third election is the election to actually impose the revenue sources. So, you know, I know there are some that say, uh, uh, you know, let's get some more time under our belt to see that the starter line really functions well and everything is, is proceeding well. Well, the answer is nobody's going to make a final decision on this until the summer of 2017. There are preliminary steps that have to get made, but really that, that last election is when you would begin uh, authorizing those revenue sources. <clears throat> uh, so uh, that's my presentation. Uh, I do want to make myself available for questions, but I, I, I don't want to, I know I've taken a long time. I know Tom has some comments he'd like to share <clears throat> with you, and then as I've said, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Tom? Mayor and Council, uh, thank you for your time this afternoon. I'm Tom Garand, Executive Director of the Kansas City Streetcar Authority. Um, I, will be, I will be pretty brief. I'm, re I'm really here to talk about the process for expansion outside of the TDD election process, um, so some thoughts from the board and some uh, potential next steps. Um, as you all know, uh, the Streetcar Authority, as a quick overview, was really a representation of a formal partnership between the City of Kansas City, Missouri, and downtown business owners and ratepayers into the district. And so it was established back in 2012 really to provide oversight and support of operations and maintenance. But in doing so, it's created a, and what we think has been a very productive partnership between the city and downtown business as it relates to thinking about how we deploy, manage, and launch uh, the streetcar system that the downtown TDD has invested itself in. Um, as a <coughs> brief recap, the board is made up of 13 directors, seven private, six public. Again, really reflecting a true public-private pri partnership. And really on behalf of the board, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to the mayor, Troy, and council. The, uh, we feel like that partnership has worked very well as it relates to the deployment, the construction, and ultimately the, the operation of the initial phase project. Um, in addition to operations and maintenance generally, the board's general functions are obviously over the last two years we were focused on making the downtown project and launching the downtown project in a manner that was as successful and as productive as it could possibly be. That's where our focus has been. Um, and in addition to that, things that come along with that are obviously operations policy decisions. When are we going to operate? How are we going to operate? Are we going to charge a fare? Will the system be free? Uh, what are we doing for safety and security of the system? 
Uh, what are we doing to make sure that it's maintained at the right levels? And how are we communicating and marking in it, not just with uh, our region, but with uh, the entire country and integrating ourselves into a broader regional transportation system? So uh, that's, in a nutshell, uh, the authority and what we're about and what we've been focused on. As it relates to expansion specifically, uh, the authority and, and our board of directors support streetcar expansion. It's probably not a surprise. Um, there are a few reasons for that that I think are worth mentioning. Uh, first and foremost, uh, there's a belief and they agree that uh, this project is part of a broader strategy for extending the benefits of streetcar to of corridors that are of, again, greater population and, and large job centers, part of a longstanding regional vision for how we would upgrade and transition corridors over time. And Main Street, um, again, is a corridor that's been identified through a number of past efforts, through coordinated regional efforts to think about how we grow this system, how we improve it, not just with regards to streetcar, but other modes over time, and, and has clearly proven itself to be the strongest candidate for near-term expansion. Um, as mentioned, there's a belief uh, by the board that expansion ultimately will strengthen the value and add value to the downtown starter line investment. So clearly, anytime you build something that's two miles in length, we're not getting much in the way of economies of scale. We have to build the systems, the operations, the facilities. Uh, we have an ability to deploy those investments that we've made downtown to, again, extend the benefits of the system to larger populations and, and job centers, particularly through Midtown and the Plaza and UMKC. And there's great potential in that for that corridor, but also there's great value for, for downtown. And um, lastly, obviously, we want to continue and we really want to urge the continuation of a partnership in an effort to protect the investment, to make sure that uh, the investment that we've made, the strategies that we've deployed on the initial project carry forward and that we build on the strengths and the capacities and the expertise uh, from the team that we've been able to assemble, not just at the Streetcar Authority, but city staff, uh, ATA has been a, a, a great partner in this as well. Um, we've got an opportunity to build on, again, capacity and, and, and frankly, a lot that we've learned from, from the beginning of this project just a few years ago. And so as we think about next steps, uh, we ourselves have questions about how expansion would work, about what it means to the downtown project. And uh, first and foremost, uh, what we're talking about and what we're really requesting and promoting is starting from the beginning with the development of a coordinated project development process. Um, all of the things that Doug talked about, as he mentioned, relate to the, the financing of the local share of a project. Uh, well, that project doesn't exist unless we can bring with it the necessary federal investments to make that project real. And in order to position ourselves for federal money, uh, there's some work that has to be done related to uh, project development, environmental, um, you name it. And so we're advocating for really coordinating a project development process with our core partners, with both within the city, over at MARC, and, and within the ATA. Um, and obviously being inclusive of our, of our key project stakeholders as we think about how a streetcar would extend and who, who, who it would potentially impact. Uh, secondarily, uh, that process of due diligence, frankly, uh, that we're talking about will require some investment. And so we're having conversations on our end. But uh, step two, as we view it, is we, we formalize a partnership. We develop a, a, a strategy for moving that forward and financing that due diligence. And then thirdly, we advance that due diligence in a coordinated fashion. And it's inclusive of the project development activities. Again, those are prerequisites for even making the ask for the federal money. We feel, we feel very strongly that the project, as conceived initially, that will be a, a really strong candidate uh, to receive significant federal investment, uh, but we have work to do on our side uh, to position it for that. Uh, we also know that this project can't be thought about in a vacuum, that it's, it's um, important that it be thought about in the context of what's happening in the corridor, how we're connecting ourselves to a broader regional system, and what other opportunities there might be for, for broader improvements outside of the streetcar extension corridor. So a corridor and system planning effort, um, conversations have already been had with the ATA and Mark <laughs> on the process to do that and to ensure that the outgrowth of, an, of a streetcar expansion is not just a streetcar expansion. It's an expansion of our regional transit system in a way that potentially even goes beyond what we're talking about here on Main Street. And that we're also at the same time coordinating a multi-year federal funding strategy. Uh, we know that there are only so many pots of funds to go after, both at MARC uh, and through the FTA, and making sure that we're on the same page 
and that we're advancing regional and local priorities around this project and others in a coordinated fashion. So we're not stepping on our own toes and that we move forward uh, collectively with priorities that have been longstanding, Prospect Max and other projects that, that are also important to, again, the broader regional system. And then lastly, we detail the specifics of how we transition and how we grow ourselves to support a bigger system. As was mentioned, the governance model uh, that uh, is reflected in the authority is reflected to provide representation to downtown ratepayers. We know if the district grows, representation for ratepayers will need to also grow. And so what does that governance transition and an expansion plan look like and how do we make sure that people feel like the controls and the checks and balances that were embedded in the initial program uh, can be continued on and again all of the things that people worked really hard on for the first project uh, that we don't take those things for granted and that we apply those learnings to uh, the potential expansion of, 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 of an extension so that is all I had. I just want to talk a little bit about the process, and I guess the big takeaway is there's work to do outside of the TDD process that RTA has, has advanced, and uh, we're motivated, we're interested in engaging and being a part of those conversations. <coughs> Thank you. Downtown Chicago. Thank Come you. on back up, Doug. Questions from Council? Councilwoman Shields. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say I, I share your uh, desire to see the streetcar line expand. I mean, I think that's something we all share in common. And I think most of us here on the council, I can't speak for everyone, share that same desire. I think the issue that's come up recently with this most current effort to expand is just the question of timing and how this fits in with other uh, priorities that the city is uh, planning and in the position of uh, beginning to think about rolling out to the public for their consideration. And I know, um, Mr. Stone, you and I had a brief conversation about this, and you said, well, we can do more than one thing at a time. And that's absolutely true in terms of the resources we can bring to developing the programs. However, as someone who's been involved in probably, I don't know how many elections, I will say that when you have an election and you're reaching out to people and you may be asking them to increase their property taxes, that in fact, if you have two competing uh, projects, maybe we shouldn't think about competing, but if a substantial part of one or both of them is going to be paid by property tax increases, then those two things do end up competing in a very unfortunate way. And we can even end up in a situation where very desire one or more of them go down because of that con con that potential conflict and that has been my issue all along is just i'm for expansion but i think that given other city priorities at this time that this is not the right time for expansion and so i and I think other people on this council, frankly, including the mayor, have expressed that position. And what I've kind of heard, I mean, you didn't tell me get lost. You just said, hey, well, we can do more than one thing at times. I mean, everybody that has raised this has at least indicated, that, that indicate they've raised it, have at least then also indicated that the response from your group has just sort of been, well, we're moving ahead. And that, that concerns me because I think your effort doesn't succeed without our support and our efforts don't succeed without yours and it just seems to me that this is ought, ought to be something that could be worked out rather than uh, the concerns being raised by many people on this council uh, being ignored. Well, let me say this. <clears throat> if I gave you the impression that... Um we were not willing to be cooperative partners with the city. I certainly didn't mean to do that. I did say, and I think it's true, that in a great city like Kansas City, uh, when the voters uh, understand the value being offered by two different proposals, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. And uh, a wise man once told me that um, uh, we're a city that can walk and chew gum at the same time. And so I think, uh, I, I think that's... Um, that's one part of my answer mm -hmm. to you. We are very willing to have a discussion with the city about uh, timing 
and coordination. We want to be partners with the city. Um, and, and so to the extent we've given that a, a contrary impression, that is not the case. Now, do we think this, does my group think this is important? Yes. So do we. I understand. Um, if we started this today, as we've done, there won't be a streetcar in the ground until 2021. And so in the meantime, people are coming to Union Station and saying, now what? Look at that big hill that I want to continue going down. And so every movement of the starting gate moves the ending gate. And so we just want the council and the public to understand that this is not a five-week process. And so uh, uh, there should be a candid, uh, cordial, cooperative discussion o over that. Um, I personally believe, and you're the elected official and I'm not, but I personally believe that the uh, support that's been expressed in the Midtown Corridor mm -hmm at every single light rail election uh, will continue and that and that there are two different questions that are going to be proposed but again i don't know if there's been polling i don't know that's I, i'm a technician yeah. right so not my question but we're happy to have those discussions well and I will certainly reach out to you, and I think some of my colleagues will as well. I hope the mayor will as well. I will say that I have, I mean, I had the discussion with you before these petitions were filed. I think other people did. I understand the mayor did. Uh, I mean, that would have been a great time to have this discussion well, was I, before I, we started down this process. And I'm sorry, my recollection of our conversation was that I said to you, our elections are not set in stone and that we can coordinate with you. And I thought that was a sufficient conversation. Look, I still haven't had a judge tell me I can go to an election, okay? And so, you know, baby steps. Now, I'm, we're, we're fortunate that we didn't have the kind of opposition. I mean, as far as I knew, when I had that conversation with you, I could have had another set of opponents, an appeal to the circuit court, and all that conversation would have been moot, premature. And so uh, let's, let's get through the judicial hearing and make sure that we actually have an election and then, that's, then you know, we've got something concrete to talk about. But we're, we want to cooperate with you. We want to be, we can't do this in a vacuum. We want to be your partner. Okay. Councilman Wagner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate you guys being here today to discuss all the pieces of this. Uh, my question probably is more to you, Doug. Um, I think there is a presumption uh, many times that when we say there may be an election and therefore a sales and or property tax associated with something, uh, <coughs> that once that is passed and everything happens immediately. But obviously in this particular case, we have got uh, federal funds that we're counting on as part of this project. Uh, and so um, as, as I think with the uh, downtown streetcar, um, at least as to my recollection, there was, well, we, we were counting on it and not kind of counting on it. But in this case, we're really counting on federal funds. So if you can explain if this prevails by those voters in the district, at what point then are the taxes uh, collected? Thank you. That's a, thank you for that question. So um, two things will have, three things will have to happen. So we talked about the three election process, the third election being the one where the financing, uh, the revenue sources are actually approved. Even that which would be in the winter of 2017, summer of 2017, uh, even that wouldn't trigger those revenue sources. They would simply be approved at that point. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe in the summer of 17. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe. So, uh, but that's only one step. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, uh, there's a commitment in our petition at the circuit court that these revenue sources wouldn't be triggered until, number one, the starter line district is dissolved right? Because there won't be two one-cent sales taxes, there'll mm -hmm. just be one. Uh, 
and the federal funding is obtained. So the shorter answer to your question is, in our model, the revenue doesn't begin until uh, 2018, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, it's possible that it would be a year later, depending upon how long it takes to get the federal funding and do the engineering. So none of that would start. It would simply be approved, but no money would flow until the federal funding was in place, which could take a year. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it would have to be it would have to be in place before you could order the vehicles because you have to mm -hmm. you know, have the issue the bonds right. to pay for it. And so at that point, you'd start the revenue. So that's roughly 2018, 2019, mm -hmm. and then service in 2021. Right. So, but I, I guess my point of my question is just to note that uh, nothing is a given, and even though we, 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 oh, we yes, speak in, in, in more immediate terms, the reality is that, and I guess to your earlier point, multiple steps – and we're talking year, well, a couple years from now, best case scenario. That's right. Best case scenario before you would even have that, if you will, competing interest actually occur, if, it, if at all. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Count um, Councilwoman Justice. Um, Thanks, Doug. I actually I really appreciate this. I um, I'm one of those Midtown voters who keeps voting yes um, and have been doing so for quite some time. And uh, I know that we've been hearing a lot this week from folks who, who feel the same way and, and are excited about the success of what's happened so far and looking forward to move moving forward. I um, I spend most of my evenings because of some decisions that I've made in my life um, at neighborhood meetings. <laughs> and um, there's a 12 step program. I think, <laughs> <laughs> and um, we talk at every neighborhood meeting that I'm in about the airport and the streetcar and the geo bond. We talk about codes inspections. We talk about. Um, picking up our, our recycle and bulky item pickup and police response time and that sort of thing. And when I have information like you presented here today, I'm able to um, basically start to dispel some myths and clear up some of the voter confusion. I had a really eye-opening experience in one of my Clay County meetings a few months ago. Um, the first meeting that I went to up there, Doug, uh, they almost ran me out of the building because I was in favor of um, a new terminal um, at the Kansas City Airport. And then later, as everybody in Kansas City knows, we pressed pause on, on the airport discussion because we're talking about other things right now. And my next meeting in Clay County, I was almost run out of the building because we had pressed pause. <laughs> um, they had changed their minds. They had gotten the information that they needed, and they had changed their mind. And so one of the things that they asked us is, why don't you tell us? Why don't you do a better job, City Council? Why don't you do a better job, City Hall? of explaining to us all of these different moving factors so that we can make a decision. And, you know, I said, I, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. How do we do that better? And so they say, you know, all sorts of ideas were thrown out there, radio ads, billboards, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, my, my response has been I just go to neighborhood meetings and try to explain the issues one at a time. That was an incredibly long lead up to what are you going to do to take this message to the city so that any voter confusion can be cleared up. I mean, we can we can have these. Um, folks are watching Channel 2, I'm sure, just glued to the screen, waiting for more information. But how do we get this out to the rank-and-file voters? Because there is going to be voter confusion. <clears throat> and I think that if, if we give them facts and data, we'll clear it up. So uh, I have two answers to that. Um, We have, in a passive way, provided information on the intertubes that one could search out. Uh, we've tried through so thank you. We've tried through social media to uh, uh, let people know that these resources are out there. Uh, I'm not going to lie; it was easier when the city was the proponent. Okay. Um, we don't have the kind of access and resources to for communication that the city had when it was the proponent. Um, 
Had you have, waited, have, you could have had the city as the proponent. Uh, thank you. Uh, had uh, uh, so the second answer to the question is uh, not my issue because there will be a campaign of some kind, right? I'm I'm just the darn lawyer, right? So I'm I'm a technician to get the court to put it on the ballot, but I am not part of any political campaign, and so. Uh, there presumably will be both messaging, positive and negative information to be put out there, uh, and and that hopefully will will do that. Now I know that members of the Kansas City Regional Transit Alliance, which is a not-for-profit that's been in existence for 20 plus years, back when Kite Singleton had hair, is when it started, uh, <laughs> and so that's how long ago it was, uh, and. Uh, uh, they are trying to make the rounds, but you know we wouldn't go up to Clay County, right? We wouldn't. That's just not in our universe. So we're talking to neighborhood associations within the corridor. We've talked to Main Core. Uh, we've talked to large property owners within the Main Street corridor. Uh, there aren't as many as there were downtown. It's kind of a different environment. Sure. Uh, but but we're doing all that. Have we? Is there more outreach to be done? Clearly. So my, so my final request and I guess question then for you is is you've made it very clear today your willingness to work with the city as as a partner and, and incredibly appreciative to hear that. Um, I would request as as part of that that you put together or not you as the lawyer and I get that there's a campaign component of this but but um, for those folks who are in favor I do believe that a citywide discussion at neighborhood association meetings would be incredibly helpful to start to clear up some of the confusion and you it can be done in a very targeted way and and I know that they know what they need to to do to make that happen and my request is as part of working with the city is making sure that we get as much information out there as possible and so I would appreciate um, everybody's help in getting that done well I think all of you know that there's nothing I like more than talking and so uh, to the extent um, helpful to that process I'll be glad to do it I know Members of the RTA are here. I know they're hearing you, uh, and so uh, I, I would imagine that they'll reach Thank out you. to you to play that role. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think all good points made by my colleagues. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you know, this has been uh, very successful no matter how you slice it. Uh, the uh, starter line, uh, we, we sat on planning and zoning, some of us, uh, the last council, and saw the evidence as developers came in they've never been in kansas city before and said we want to develop along the streetcar line over a billion dollars uh, the numbers growing a lot of housing options that weren't there a few years ago uh the ridership numbers are phenomenal i mean you can't uh, it's just uh, they've exceeded expectations anything i thought was going to happen i mean we and it's been great to see the uh when you get on the streetcar the mix of people on the streetcar it's really uh a, mi a mixture of everybody that's in Kansas City, and uh, I think it's uh, been very successful. The uh, couple of miscellaneous points and questions on, uh, based on some of the other questions that are raised. So the, the timing issue, I think, uh, you know, I've heard some people say we're going too fast. We heard that with the starter line. It happened too quickly because it was done well. Russ Johnson did a great job of organizing, organizing it with staff and, and others involved in the community, many that are here. Um, but the federal funding is a big question mark. And so we don't even get to that point until you take some of these baby steps, as you mentioned. Uh, the timing is so far out that there's really no harm in, in moving forward if we all agree that that's a good idea. Now, I, can, I think I can speak for my colleagues and say our number one priority is the infrastructure bond. No doubt, streets and sidewalks are the number one thing uh, that we hear at community meetings. Uh, but I'm I'm of the belief that we can do more than one thing at once. We're a larger city now. It's different from 20 years ago, 30 years ago. We can uh, have multiple things going on at the same time. And I think our our smart our voters are uh, very smart, and so uh, they will in November have multiple items on the ballot. They're going to have to make a decision on all at once and so I don't think doing two things at once uh, is any uh, 
major feat. Uh, the uh, other aspect of this that we can't forget is I know in the last week, I, I think like my colleagues, I have received dozens and dozens of emails and phone calls from the community. This is a community-driven project. This isn't uh, uh, something that we can take lightly uh, when we have so many people really uh, promoting this. And so uh, I uh, really appreciate all the uh, uh, letters of support or emails that I've received. It's been um, helpful to see that. and. Uh, I would just encourage us to move forward and uh, at the same time coordinating dates and things like that, but there's no reason we can't do both things at once, the transfer transportation and infrastructure bond uh, at the same time. Can I, may, I, may I say something? You, yeah. you talked about Kansas City being a, a, a bigger city. I just want to just bear with me for an anecdote. A lot of you know I've got two boys. Um, one is 26 and one is 19. When my 26-year-old graduated high school, he couldn't leave town fast enough. He went to Chicago for college. <coughs> After Chicago, he went to San Francisco, neither of which city he could afford to live in. Okay? You could. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I raised my boys to stand on my two feet. <laughs> and so... Uh, so, uh, uh, my 26-year-old now is back here, and I don't know, Mayor, but you may actually got an email from him about the uh, film tax credit, right. because he's in video production, and he's, in fact, as we speak, working on uh, all small things, or whatever the name of that movie is that's yep. filming here. He is part of the crew, so thank you for that. But the, and he loves Kansas City. But here's the real point. My 19-year-old is up in Boston at Brandeis. I had dinner with him last night. It's tr honest truth. I had dinner with him last night. And he said to me, um, so I said, you know, what do you, th how, you know, it's Boston. He's like, you know, this is the truth. He said, you know, there's just no city vibe there. There's just no, there's office buildings, but I don't, doesn't, grab me. He said, what I really want to do is come back to Kansas City because it's happening here. I am not making that up. And so, Councilman Taylor, when you say, look, I moved here in 1993, okay? Downtown was wig shops and barbecue, a couple of barbecue joints. Haunted houses. Right. Houses. Right. Look at what we've done. Look at what we've done. We should be proud of ourselves. We can walk and chew gum at the same time, and our citizens know what they want, and they're telling you what they want. Sorry. Thank you. No, thank you. All right. Uh, Councilwoman Shields. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to get back kind of a little bit to what brought this up, which was uh, just some general, uh, some general understanding. Uh, there was an audit done, I guess, last... October or something on the streetcar they brought up some I'm not going to read the suggestions but several different suggestions and the city manager responded to them and basically said they're all good suggestions but basically uh, these governance structure changes will need to be negotiated and require the consent of the streetcar authority thus there's no guarantee of the outcome and I just wondered if we had begun discussions with the streetcar authority where we were and Maybe even like with your new appointments, where are they on these issues, and are we moving to get them resolved? We don't have new appointments yet. Well, your oh, excuse me, your suggested new appointments. Yeah, which were held, so they're not there yet. But go ahead. Yeah, the suggested new appointments. There you go. I'll correct it. No worries. Troy, did you want you want me to take yeah, it? I'm I, happy to. I will uh, quickly. We, once the audit came out, we started working on. Uh, dealing with those issues and making sure that the streetcar authority um, 
the issues raised by the audit were, were addressed. And so those conversations have, have continued in terms of revising the agreements, that the operating agreements under which we both operate on. We incorporated into the budget. Uh, I believe we are, they are going to be a component unit of the city. Yes, I saw that. Uh, because of the, the, in, uh, the, the inter interconnected nature of it. So they've been a good partner to work with it once the city auditor identified those issues. And the big issue on that was to make sure that that procurement process about how we went about creating the streetcar authority, mm -hmm. Because we're using federal grant funds we, and how it was procured, we wanted to make sure that issue was resolved before anything happened going forward. Right. So I, uh, Tom can elaborate, uh, but uh, that, that process has worked real well. I believe most of those issues are working out, and they may be in the agreements, may be in, if not dr uh, final form, near, near yes, final I, form. I would say I hate that the vast majority of them were responded to in a week or two's time. So Great. in pretty short order, and then there were a few others that just required agreement amendments uh, that are in the process of being uh, formalized, but there uh, there were no points of contention. There were, uh, I think, pretty direct responses that were issued immediately following that audit release. So we were um, in agreement with suggestions Great. and we're working collaboratively with city staff on making those modifications. Wonderful. When do you think we would expect to see the am am amendments to the contract if those are required? Uh, we can probably have those to you in the next couple of weeks. I believe they're not even in a position where they even require council approval, but we could certainly bring them back. At least for a report sure. or Absolutely. an update. Absolutely. We could be happy to do that. Mm -hmm. This might actually push us to make sure the, the legal paperwork catches up with Great. the intent. Great. Councilwoman Kennedy. Thank you. Um, so this has been very helpful to flesh out some of the, the questions about who's doing it, how much it's going to cost, where the money's going to come from. Uh, and I appreciate you giving us that level of discussion. Um, this is a very high-level conversation. It's being presented by a lawyer to the legislative body. In order for us to be able to convey this effectively to Joe Citizen to make an informed decision on how to vote for this, that's, that's potentially a very expensive campaign. And so I understand your role as a technician is not to anticipate that as the political piece and the legislative piece. We do have to anticipate that. Um, now, we are burdened with the responsibility of this infrastructure issue that we're having to carry to our constituents and make sure they understand that and the necessity of that and the, the cost sharing that comes along with that. And there, there's, there's an additional message that is being proposed to accompany that potentially at the same time. Um, so there's the, fu there's the messaging, there's the, the funding of, of the separate campaigns, uh, and that's not even accounting for those that may not be supportive in the opposition campaigns that will come from either of these issues. Um, so there are a number of different things that, that fall within this conversation that we're really not even discussing at this point. Um, but I, I do think that we have to figure out um, how, what is the next step of the, of the, the starter line. It, I mean, it has to go somewhere. But I, I believe timing is, a, is, an, is something that we have to factor in. Um, it's not, you know, do we extend it, it's when we extend it and, and doing it in a, in a manner where it, it makes sense to, to everybody. And I'll give you a story. Uh, I, was, uh, in, I was clerking at a firm up in Sioux Falls not, maybe five years ago. Not even that. It was 2009, so maybe it was five years ago. It will be six, seven years ago. Well, it's been a little while. <laughs> <laughs> so time is flying. It wasn't a mathematics firm, was it? All right. No. So I'll tell you, I was riding with one of the partners, Bill Kunzel, and we were riding down 29, and he's like, you know, how's Kansas City? You know, he wants to know how I ended up in South Dakota the whole nine. And how's Kansas City? I'm like, Kansas City, it's, it's good. It's home. You know, it has a lot of potential. You know, we have the sports teams here. They don't have that up there. I mean, we're the closest sports teams. And so Kansas City really is a regional city. Uh, I said, but we still have, you know, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of areas, you know, to, to improve. Uh, there's still a big divide in Kansas City. And he was like, well, how so? And I began to tell him about, you know, where I grew up in Kansas City uh, and then where I came to visit when I came back home on my breaks from South Dakota and I hung out downtown. So it was very different in, in the perspectives. I was like, but, you know, maybe in the next five years or so, five to ten years, Kansas City would be, I mean, it would be a totally different place. Well, we're five to ten years in that range now, and it is a totally different place. So what your, your son is saying is what I said when I left and came back as well. But in order for us to continue on this, we have to do it responsibly. We have to make sure that we're addressing the needs. And as you talked about as a parent, you know, the needs of your 26-year-old and your 19-year-old are different. That's what we face in Kansas City. 
we have areas of our city that are older than 26 years old, and then we have areas that are very new, and they have competing interests. And as this group, we have to be responsible in how we address all those issues across the board. Streetcar is it's, it's great. Um, it makes sense for us to expand it, but do we do it now? Do we get the new car now? Do we upgrade now is really the question that we have to figure out. Um, and, and I would like for us to be able to have that conversation where it's not adversarial because we have a constituency that wants to do it, that's willing to support it, but we have a, a number of people in this city that feel like other things need to come first. And so I would hope that we would not create an environment where, where there's this, you know, this antagonistic discussion between the residents that we're asking to support all things that are important to us. <coughs> so the timing piece is the part that I would hope that we would be able to you know, figure out what, what that looks like. And we're already in court now, so that piece is already moving along. But the people that you represent, that they understand the other competing interests that we have to consider as well. Uh, thank you. That's, that's certainly uh, a reasonable approach. I, I guess I would react to that just by saying reasonable minds can differ, right? And we can certainly have a cordial conversation about it. But what I want to make sure everybody is clear about is that these uh, special assessments would only apply within a certain portion of this district. And so what, you're really, what you really have are two different constituencies. You have the city as a whole who's going to be asked whether they want to, as an entire community, fund increased infrastructure through the city as a whole. But then you're going to ask a smaller group of people whether, in addition to that, are they willing to, to fund, to invest in this corridor where they are specifically benefiting? That's what special assessments are. Uh, and so that's really a different question. I don't – and I, I, I respect what you're saying. You know me. Yeah. But I just don't think they're competing in that same way. You're not going to the same group of people – saying, well, all of you bear all of these costs. You go into the city as a whole and saying, let's build sidewalks, yes or no. And then you're going to the people along this line and saying, now, do you guys want to pay some more to do this? And they're going to say yes or no. Yeah. But, but maybe if the, oh, hold it, hold I'm it, sorry, hold it, hold it, I apologize. It. Yeah, let's go ahead, finish. follow-up question is, um, you're right, in a very general sense, but we're going to be asking for federal dollars to help support this initiative, the same federal pool of money we're going to the ask to support Prospect Max. No, no, not really. It's different programs. It's totally different they're different pools different of money. Programs. So thank you for clarifying yeah, that. Yeah, they're not the same. But when you have, um, I, I get your point. You're saying you're asking a smaller group of people to pay more. But the timing, I think, is still an important piece because there are 50 people that said, yes, let's start this. But, you know, how many people, and I don't know, like you said, the polls and stuff are going to be necessary. Are we additional, you're going to have to educate in this area to separate or make a distinction between the two different things. Okay. You're right. Okay. Councilman Fowler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and, Councilman Fowler. Uh, thank you for this presentation. It was Sorry, very enlightening. Uh, however, I'm used to lawyers turning their back on me. Um, it was very enlightening uh, and, and very helpful in understanding the process. Uh, however, I want to add my voice to those of Councilwoman Shields and Councilwoman Kennedy uh, because I agree with you that this city can do more than one thing at the same time, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that those two things in many respects come out of the same people's pockets. In other words, uh, uh, somebody's going to have to dip in twice, and in certain parts of the area you're going to, I'm afraid that those dollars could be kind of tight for a lot of people, and I, I particularly worry about seniors uh, who are on fixed incomes. And they will vote in both. Uh, and I guess you're right, it would be up to them to decide. But I think, uh, at least for my own part, my own constituency, the infrastructure needs are great in this city. And I am, I, as Councilwoman Shields says, we're concerned of the timing of this. Um, I have another concern, and that is, while I agree the streetcar is going leaps and bounds right now, uh, I'm concerned that the new hasn't worn off, and 
I wonder what it's going to like going to look like in November, December, January, and February when uh, conditions outside are not that great. And so I guess I was taken aback by the rapidity of the process when we haven't had that experience yet to see how it does function in those times. So uh, I just wanted to express those concerns. I do have a question, and that is in looking at your uh, operations and debt service comparison uh, that I think was well, <coughs> not numbered, but uh, on on one side you saw the city's contribution at two million seventy five thousand. On the other side, two million thirty nine thousand. I guess by and, and you may have answered this already. I just didn't pick up on it. You weren't here. I was. I was physically. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you won't talk about where you are now. Then. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> Um, is that, are those, do, at the end of the day, if all this goes through and you start running, do we combine those two for the final number? Or no. they, there are comparisons as to, uh, the, if I go one, one on the slide more, please, I think. Yes. So uh, I, I explained to the council earlier that under the current set of agreements for downtown, uh, there is a city contribution of a million two plus the city special assessment based on city property values which can fluctuate and presumably grow uh -huh. and so in today's universe with the downtown star line district the city's contribution is not set in stone it fluctuates from year to year uh, in 2016 it's expected to be 2075 correct okay <coughs> we, we knew that was a concern for the city and so we in our model for the new district we uh, uh, simply uh, fixed the city's contribution at a straight 2.039 million, which is consistent with an existing city council resolution. Uh, oh, you know, I'm just concerned about that. How 30778. If they're community so, versus does the 239. No, it replaces it. Essentially, it replaces what it does it. is it removes a moving target and puts and in a, a fixed, fixed target. Okay, right. Sorry. And reduces it. All right. Thank you. Although a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Councilman McManus. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm glad. This is a lot of what I was going to ask you about and, and comment on has been covered. But this slide actually is, I think, um, a really helpful slide for me, at least, in this, in this dialogue. Because um, as someone who doesn't represent an area within the starter line or within the proposed expansion line, I often get questions about what's it going to cost me, you know, in my district. And so... Well, I know that the focus will be, you know, like you said, you're putting the tea in the ground. There's a lot of things that have to happen. It's a long-term process. There's a lot of conditions that have to be satisfied. There are votes to be counted, and those votes will not be coming from my district. The interesting thing to me is third phase is <laughs> is to be able to communicate to those folks who aren't voting what is it going to cost them and. This slide, I think, demonstrates that the cost goes down, but also that the cost is fixed. And those two changes, I think, are significant. And so one of the things I would challenge you to do, and I think Councilwoman Justice kind of talked about this a little bit, I don't have to go to Clay County. <laughs> I, I do by choice, but not by requirement. But uh, I have to go out to, say, you know, near Cass County, sure. you know. And, and so the question becomes, you know, me communicating this, which I'm happy to do. But ultimately, since you all, this is a community-driven proposal, and that dialogue is not coming from the city ultimately, I think the challenge to you all will be to communicate to the city as a whole this message. And I think it's a critical message because I think it's, it answers that question in a very succinct way. Um, and I think it gets to the heart of the matter, which is that while this line won't be located in every part of the city, it will drive a benefit that everybody in the city can use. And I think we're seeing that now, um, folks coming to use the Star Line from all over, not just from Kansas City, but regionally. Um, <laughs> and so I guess it's not really a question, but more of a comment and a challenge for you, you know, as you go forward with this. Because I, I do understand some of the concerns, because while they aren't being asked. The city as a whole isn't being asked for two different things. The questions will arise from a city as a whole, and, and those times will overlap. And so I think I hope that you'll be a partner in helping us 
communicate that message because I think it's critically important to be able not only for this to succeed, but for the city's endeavors on infrastructure to succeed. We certainly pledge to do that. I got Councilman Lucas. Did somebody else down there? Okay. Councilman Lucas. <coughs> uh, thank you, gentlemen, for the presentation. I've enjoyed seeing the streetcar's progress and excitement. I have a very brief comment. Like uh, Councilman Shields, just about everybody else has said, uh, I support your efforts right now, and I wish you all the very best. We spent a lot of time talking about 20-somethings, uh, and sometimes when I think about 20-somethings, I think of a 20-something 30 years ago who was my mother who caught the bus every day with three kids and was uh, – basically using bus transit to get around Kansas City. And a lot of things have improved over the last 30 years. I don't know if somebody catching a bus where she was back then actually has a more convenient east-west route today. This doesn't necessarily address that, but I know you talked about that when I saw you in the Northland. As we talk about expansion, I encourage you all, seriously, to think about those connecting areas, 39th Street, 47th Street, at 31st and Linwood, and to make sure that even though this is something that looks like a very north-south paradigm, it really, once and for all, does start to answer some of that regional conversation and question we have. So we come back in 30 years and talk about the 20-something who may not make their way downtown in Plaza a lot, uh, we can actually talk about real progress there. So thank you. Okay. okay. Um, and just, we, we did try that. <laughs> I mean, uh, thank you for was, not making was, me say that. That thank was you, the Mayor. very first thing that we tried to do. Um, and um, let's just say that it was not received well with those 20-somethings that you're talking about because we really pushed that as the centerpiece, frankly, and it was rejected. The reason it's going south now is because those people didn't reject it. If it had been the other way around, then we'd probably be going east and west. Go ahead. I'll just say this, I, and I, I love those efforts. It's just one of those things we can't quit on, right? Not and so that's why I'm, I'll keep saying it, and if, and if this fails too, I'll say it in 20 years and 30 years and all but of that. But here's the thing. Why don't we get 50 people from Jackson County registered to vote who champion that, and if they can do exactly the same thing that the KCRTR is doing, or A is doing right now. And, it, it, you know, all they got to do is come forward and say, we're willing to work on it and get this done. And then they can join with the group, and we can get that done, too. I think that it's always been our goal to go east and west on this. And was horribly disappointed it didn't work. You know, and I'm sorry, let me just add this. Um, I had a slide that I removed from my presentation. Um, now I'm sorry I did. Uh, I had a voting heat map that showed the yes and no. And I chose to rather simply say to you all that Maestri Carter has consistently supported this. Uh, but it was disheartening to me personally, and I know to a lot of other people here, that, uh, that the effort to create a broader um, system that reached across divides was unsuccessful. Uh, but when you look at those voting results, and, you know, the mayor's right, those, a group from there could do it. But why in their, why would they do that when you look at the sentiment? So the first thing that has to happen to, to make that work is for there to be a community sentiment that, that that's, creates value there. And maybe the more experience we have with the starter line, then connecting down to UMKC. By the way, we haven't talked about the fact that this takes UMKC students and brings them downtown. The more we create a connectivity that people can touch and feel, then maybe an east-west route becomes not just a possibility but a desire. And that's what you need. You know, one other point to make sure that, you know, my I don't obfuscate my own point. While I certainly think streetcar expansion east-west is important, another point I was really making yes. was, right, connectivity to our now existent bus service and making sure that, right, while we have this line of development and thought, we're actually thinking about those. So even short of going through the longer, broader political effort and the changing of hearts and minds, maybe we just – get people to say, wow, this is neat. I start at 39th and Paseo, and look, now as I'm crossing 39th Street, I have reason to get off up north or south or anything of that sort. 
And just to reinforce uh, Councilman's point there, um, there is an active effort, uh, the Ride KC plan uh, spearheaded by the ATA. We've had extensive conversations. We're partners in that. Uh, Mark's partners in that. Other transit operations in the region are part of that. And part of, part of that effort is, is essentially what you're referring to as we think about incremental steps towards improve, improving our regional transportation system. And so um, definitely on our radar screen, what we're, what we're advocating for and talking about at the authority isn't about election timing, it's about the due diligence to lay forward a plan that addresses the questions about how do we maximize if it's streetcar, streetcar south, while doing these other things in a coordinated strategic way uh, that again builds on the things that have worked well and, and, and perhaps goes farther than we would otherwise be able to go. And there so, are, oh, sorry, sorry. So Independence Avenue, right. Linwood, um, you know, east of Van Brunt and the Truman Sports Complex, these are regional priority corridors that have been on the regional plan forever, right, for a long time, just like Prospect. And so thinking about how we, how we integrate this work um, and that due diligence is really what we're suggesting, regardless of timing of elections. Uh, there's additional work that we could collectively be doing and that we want to do on detailed streetcar planning and project development that at the same time addresses questions about a broader vision and about other near-term strategies that we could be taking together. And from a financial perspective, uh, one of the things that the fixed uh, dollars do versus the fluctuating dollars, this, this proposal doesn't require any, in fact, it reduces the amount of public mass transit funds. And so, uh, were this to be successful in the streetcar runs from UMKC all the way down to River Market, there are currently bus assets uh, and resources that could be redeployed to provide better service in other areas. It's not that the service is going to go away. You still have the buses. Presumably, you would take that same service that's there now and deploy it elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Lohr. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to first of all quickly say I don't think anyone on the council uh, does not support the streetcar and the extension of it I want to again suggest how timing is critical and no matter what we do as uh, Councilman McManus says this is going to get confusing and the Northlanders are going to think they're going to be paying for a streetcar and we can't reach all of them uh, and that's just the facts I'm, I'll just say it right out there now so I think timing we need to sit down and talk about this for the good of the city. Uh, the second thing I want to ask is probably more directed to you, uh, Mr. City Manager. What are the costs, um, not the streetcar hard costs here, but what are the costs underground that the city has had to pay for sewers and water lines and street repairs and what, what are those costs? Uh, for the downtown starter line, we replaced all the water and uh, water lines in that entire corridor and relined all the sewers. We paid about, a, I think that number was about $22 million. Um, that work was done through the water and sewer uh, project. Uh, we would look to do the same thing if this moves forward, that we would replace the water and sewer lines. They need to be replaced anyway. Uh, in addition, we spent about a million dollars uh, using 4th District PIAC funds for sidewalk repair so along that. So we fixed all the sidewalks, and then we incrementally allocated about a million dollars of our street resurfacing program so that once the construction was done, we went and re resurfaced Main Street at that same time. So there were citywide dollars, it, but it was done from a project coordination. But the big expense was the to replace the water and sewer, to relocate them out of the corridor so that we've got access long term so that we don't... Uh, moved the utility mm -hmm. corridor, but they were uh, 18, 1874 water lines. Mm -hmm. You may have heard my story about a wooden water line that yeah. came out of this project, mm -hmm. um, and uh, 1865 sewers. So uh, we had gotten our value out of them. So while we were in there, <laughs> we, uh, they were fully advertised. Yeah, we, yes, uh, right. We, we took the opportunity to replace yeah. it. Yeah. The other thing that, cool. that did affect, and I think this will bear fruit long term, is the other utilities, KCPNL. And Missouri Gas Energy also took the opportunity to upgrade their infrastructure at the time. So the advantage is in, along that Main Street corridor, most of the infrastructure both at grade level and below grade level has been upgraded and is probably good for a good 50 to 75 years. So that's one of the advantages of when you take this opportunity out um, 
and I would recommend we do the same thing as we move south, that we just build that into the plan to replace that infrastructure or rehab it. Okay, but the $22 million that came out for the water line and sewer lines, mm -hmm. that money came from where? Came from our water and sewer, sewer utilities, yes. As part so of the rate payers, right? Okay, so they're paying for some of this too. And we'll continue to pay on a citywide basis. Right. So uh, $22 million plus the $2 million uh, up here that we pay on an annual contribution. That's citywide money too also. Yeah, that, the $2 million comes from and the public mass transfer, the public mass transportation. Sure. I, I would argue on the $22 million, we would have we would have paid for it anyway. It sure. was just a question of when. Sure. Uh, this was the time to do it when, when the when the trench was open. But it, we had... It was going to need to be replaced. Well, my so, point, yeah. I don't care when it got done. My point is people from all over the city are paying oh, yeah. for this and paying into it. So we just need to keep that in mind. Again, when the confusion comes in on who's paying for what, you're going to get the people in Clay and Platte County saying, I, I don't ride the streetcar. It does nothing for me. And you say, well, you're not paying for it. Well, yeah, they are. They are contributing to something. No, I, I disagree with that, Councilwoman, because when the people from Clay County come downtown, and now that's the, not the issue. Oh, that's I, not I, the I issue. beg to differ. Hold on, hold on. Let him finish. I beg to differ. We, we, are, we are an entire city. The sewer service and water service downtown that supports the workers who come downtown from Clay County, you had water lines from the 1870s. This had to be done no matter what. If anything, it was cheaper to do it while the street was open. And so, you know, we hear about uh, some, war some pipe burst downtown that evacuates a building or creates an emergency situation. We just fixed all that. You had to fix it anyway. Yeah. If anything, it cost you less to fix it when the street was open. So the people in Clay County uh, and the rest of Jackson County and all over the city who utilize the, our great downtown in our metropolitan area, they all benefited from that. That's not because of the streetcar. That's because the city needed to do that. And it's appropriate to pay for it the way it was paid. Whatever. Councilwoman Hall. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions, and I won't, I won't repeat the ones that I've already heard. Um, after yesterday's seminar meeting, I have learned <laughs> how not to repeat, okay? <laughs> I promise, you broke me of it. Um, the question that um, that I heard Councilwoman Lohr ask, and please let me know if I'm if I'm not using your words right, is yes, all, exactly to your point. Those things did need to happen, and they do need to take place. However, my opinion is that then everybody in Kansas City should be voting on a project that happens in Kansas City, even if it doesn't affect them in their TDD, and that's where I believe maybe you were thinking you expect. All of us should have a say in that. If it's all of our money, we're all paying for it. Not that it does need to happen, but that when it does happen, we all should get to have a say. And I believe that the people that live in Cass, Clay, Jackson, and Platt, who don't ride the streetcar, um, would be more amenable to paying for a streetcar if they knew from the beginning that this is what it's going to cost me so that there's no gray area. Otherwise, we think people are lying to us. And that's what people do. When they don't have any information, they make up whatever they want to make up because that's all they know. That's, that's my contention of this. Um, to date, right now, um, I am probably the only one on the council who isn't supportive of expanding the streetcar. Um, I will admit that I think that while it's a great idea and it looks fun and it's exciting, um, the jury's still out on whether it's going to be a success long term. We don't know that. And we don't know it because we've not been doing it long enough to do it. And I would recommend that before we actually D devote tons of time, money, resources into building another line that we give it a good year to determine whether we've been through all the cycles of all the different terms because in fact in the winter it's going to have a different ridership and I believe I understand from when Mrs. McIntyre came to speak to us one time that it will not be free forever. So eventually people are going to be paying, am I correct? There is no plans as long as it's a two-mile route um, to to impose a fare. We've got um, no fare equipment. We've the policy from the board has been and from the ratepayers into the downtown TDD that um, the financial model has been set up and established to not require a fare. 
Okay, well, then that's fine. But however, she did say eventually we would be charging people, and we don't know what that's going to look like either. So at this point, I feel like we are being a little premature in making a decision for something that we don't even know if it's working well yet. It's working well right now because it's fun and it's a novelty, and I still have friends who twi on Twitter are going, oh, it's our first time on the streetcar. People are riding it. They're trying it out. They're seeing what it's like. But until I have more data, I'm not inclined to support moving forward with another chunk of taxpayers as well as federal dollars and other locations of money that we're going to be getting for the project to see where it's going to go. And I would like to just have a little more data. Well, the good news is you'll have that because, as I indicated earlier, uh, this is a more than a year process to get to the final election where you would actually make the final decision whether to move forward. And, in fact, the city has to make the decision to move forward on federal funding. And so um, all we're talking about is the beginning, is the starting gate, right? So, so uh, you won't have that election to approve the revenue sources until the, uh, uh, the summer or fall of 2017. <clears throat> so you'll have a full year mm -hmm. of service under your belt by that time. But between now and then, we're going to expend a whole lot of city resources. You're not. No, wait, let me finish. Sorry. We're going to expend a whole lot of city resources hiring people to do some research to determine what's going on, and that is an expense that we will incur based on, I don't know where that money go, comes from, but I believe I'm right on that. Maybe not, but I believe The city is. manager would have to speak to that. As far as the process we're undertaking, yeah. this is a private sector effort, not funded by the city whatsoever. Well, I appreciate you saying that, but the taxpayers will end up paying for the project once it's happened. So I'm just saying, before I'm willing to go any further with this, I would love to have more data and more time under our belt to see how successful it really is long term. Because my opinion always is spend money on infrastructure before you do the fun stuff. And I consider this more of a fun thing versus um, a necessity for Kansas City. I'd like to see our finishing our sewers and doing our roads and our bridges and our sidewalks, the things that people need every day to use, the whole collective city needs. And so. I, I really honestly do not mean to be disrespectful when I say this. No. If you, no, 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 no. Here's, here's, here's what it is. Here's what it is. It's new to us, okay? And so the streetcar seems like it's a toy train, but if you look at Denver and you look at uh, Boston and you look at New York. Now, they're bigger cities, although Denver's not. This is a part of the fabric of the transit infrastructure. This is not, this is not a carnival ride, right? This is connected, in, interconnected with the bus system and all the other transit opportunities in the city. And so it doesn't feel that way yet because it is shiny and new. But I, I would encourage you not to think of this as, as a um, toy. Oh, I don't think of it as a toy. It's too expensive for me to think of it as a toy. Fair enough. Okay. I, I think of it. We've already done this before, though. I mean, we have had a train system in Kansas City. We did that um, down, you know, down Warren. I'll remember when we had that. Sure. And um. so, oh, well, I remember it. Um, I, maybe I'm older than you, but um, I remember that. And I'm wondering if it was such a great idea why we're doing it again and why we didn't do it for several years. And here we are again. So I would ask for just more data is all I'm asking for. And I'll be respectful in the conversation. I will not be a us versus them, I promise. I will listen intelligently to anything you have to say about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Before I let you go, um, last week we had on the docket and up for a vote two resolutions to appoint one member to the TDD. Uh, commission and two members to the uh, uh, streetcar authority that were held uh, ostensibly because people said they did not know what the roles and functions of those people would be. So while they're here, if there's anybody who has any questions about those issues, uh, please raise them now so we can get that taken care of because I would expect that we would be able and willing to vote on this today and get it taken care of. It's a ministerial administrative act. Uh, so if there's some question that you have about what those people do in those functions, let's get it on the table now so we can deal with it. No. Yes, count, I was just going to say, Mr. Mayor, I found the uh, memo from the law department very helpful in explaining the, different, uh, the, the difference between the two commissions, and uh, I appreciate that very much, and I appreciate your uh, willingness to give me a little time to get up to date. No worries. 
anybody else on anything? Yes, Councilman Barnes. Is, did did is we it? get the names on the ordinance this time, or the resolution this time? The names, names of, of the, the individuals. They were there last time. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. They were on mine. We, we didn't have the copies. Oh, okay. We just had the title that was on the agenda. Okay, that's well, the, that's, you, I'm sorry. I yeah, no, I, I know. I don't type. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were on mine. And no one's <laughs> trying to assign them. What? Who are they? Um, uh, Jan Markison. Uh, Michael Russ, Collins. Uh, Michael Collins from Port Authority on the Streetcar Authority. And uh, Matt Schaub, uh, Staub on um, TDD. Matt Staub is already on TDD. He's been there since the beginning. He's really just being renewed, I think. Yeah. Anything else regarding that? Did that answer your question? I don't know who the names were. Thank yeah, that's you. it. Everybody got that? Any other questions about it? Cool. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate you. your thank presentation you and the information. I'm sure that we'll be in touch. Thank you. Okay, next item. On, I'm sorry, did you have something? No, no, no. I didn't. I forgot we weren't. Yeah, we're not quite done yet. We're not quite <laughs> It might feel like we should be, but we're not quite. Uh, ordinances, resolutions, communications on today's docket or for floor introduction. Anything, folks? Nothing? All right, uh, Councilman Wagner. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move that we go into closed session pursuant oh. to RSMO 610.021 sub 3 as it relates to a personnel matter. It's been moved and seconded that we go into closed session pursuant to 610.021-3 for personnel matters. Is there any discussion on that motion? If not, the clerk will call the roll. Wagner. Aye. Hall. Aye. Lohr. Aye. Fowler. Aye. Lucas. Aye. Reed. Aye. Shields. Aye. Justice. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Kennedy. Aye. Taylor. Aye. McManus. Aye. James. Aye. 13 ayes. All right, we're in closed session.